like to discuss a case report that I've been participating in. It's a malignant and solenoma case report. And as a third year student, I found it extremely interesting because not all doctors during their practice get to see a patient with uh, an insulinoma and especially malignant insulinoma. So uh, first of all, I would like to talk about insulinomas overall. And insulinomas are extremely rare pancreatic tumors, the incidence of which is two to four cases per million patients a year. And 95% of those tumors are benign and usually less than one centimeter in diameter. And the bigger the tumor gets, the more, the more malignant it can get. There are no, the etiology and the pathogenesis of this tumor is unknown. Um, all age groups can be affected by this tumor, but usually not below 15. And the main, um, the main incidence is between 40 to 60 years. Um, the tumor is equally divided between the, the body, the tail, and the head of the pancreas. And um, the majority are the majority of, this, of these tumors is located in the pancreas or attached to the wall, but there are some extra pancreatic and endocrine tumors which are usually located in the duodenal wall. Um, usually an insulinoma presents with fasting hypoglycemia and neuroglycopenic syndromes which result from uh, catecholamine release and uh, hyperinsulinism. And to describe organic hyperinsulinism, uh, there is such thing as a Whipple triad which includes fasting hypoglycemia, um, level of glucose under 2.2 millimol per liter, and the relief of symptoms on administration of glucose. Usually the symptoms, the neuro neurological symptoms involve diplopia, blurred vision, um, maybe anxiety, and the parasympathetic symptoms can include increased sweating, nausea, uh, sometimes it, it can even lead to loss of consciousness and uh, vomiting and seizures. So the case presentation that I'm about to tell you is of a female woman aged 22 years who presented with episodes of syncope accompanied by seizures one to four times a day and um, with warning symptoms of dizziness, blurred vision, excessive sweating, nausea and constant fatigue. Her um, glucose level was measured and it was 1.8 millimol per liter. During a thorough neurolog neurolog neurological examination, uh, epilepsy was ruled out. And from the history of the patient, she had, the, she had no insignificant, the physical examination was insignificant. She had no history of any endocrine or heart uh, abnormalities. Her pa her, the, pe the medical history of her, pa of her parents was insignificant as well. Uh, and the patient herself noticed that when eating food high in carbohydrates, the symptoms seemed to resolve. So she noticed a recent gain weight of 5 kilograms for the last year. And she has been noticing those symptoms for the past one and a half years. During a CT of the, abdomen ca of the abdominal cavity, multiple focal lesions from 8 to 9 millimeters in diameter to 23-25 millimeters in diameter were noticed. An endoscopic ultrasound certain, uh, showed certain focal changes of the pancreatic parenchyma. No signs of liver enlargement in the left or the or no sign no signs of liver enlargement, but as in also during the endoscopic ultrasound, multiple focal lesions of the liver were found. And the surgical team decided to to go with um, the distal pancreatic resection with a splenectomy and lymphadenectomy. And during the surgical procedure, um, there was found a three centimeter endocrine tumor in the tail of the pancreas and multiple liver metastases that were diffusely diffused among, uh, in, in the liver. And the immunohistochemical examination showed that it was a malignant, high differentiated insulin producing uh, endocrine carcinoma, the KI, co uh, the KI index, the KI 67 index was 21%. After the surgical treatment, the patient followed with uh, chemotherapy, which included sandocytin lar two injections uh, for the first day, and then uh, chemotherapy with arenosa and <coughs> for six courses were recommended for her. The post-op period was uh, complicated by a subfrenal abscess 
but it was drenated with ultrasound control. And an 18th, follow, an 18th month follow-up showed the reduction of liver metastasis by approximately 30% after chemotherapy. And right now this patient is doing well. She's on the waiting list for a liver transplant. Even though during an uh, 18 month follow-up, <coughs> several lymph node metastases apart from those that were resected were found. But considering the situation, she's still on the donor list for a liver transplant. <coughs> and since those tumors are extremely rare, there are not a lot of cases of them. Uh, the diagnostic procedures are not really, in some countries, they're not that protocolized. So when diagnosing an uh, insulinoma or any other endocrine tumor, first what a, a doctor should do is rule out the syndrome of multiple endoplasia, multiple neuroplasia. So multiple hormones should be tested and a CT scan of course should be, should be proceeded. Uh, first of all, imaging in diagnosing neuroendocrine tumors is very important. And an ultrasound is usually 50 or 60 percent accurate. Then comes of course CT and MRI and endoscopic ultrasound, scintigraphy of course, angiography and intra-arterial calcium stimulated blood sampling which can indicate the part of the pancreas where the tumor is located depending on the levels of insulin produced by stimulating different parts of the pancreas but what is used in the hospital that I study at and the, is combination of an endoscopic ultrasound of course a CT and a regular ultrasound as a screening for people with organic hyperinsulinism and I think that it can be interesting to other people because not every doctor can see a case of what you can Any questions? So, um, isn't there also PET for diagnosing insulinoma? Uh, yes, of course. But in Moscow, there are two PET scans. Two PET scans. Okay. In the, for t t to a 15 million people, two PET scans, and um, the procedure itself costs so much that not all of the patients can proceed with it, and not all clinical um, and not all hospitals can actually do that. No, well. I'm just uh, mm -hmm. thought yeah, of course, possible. of course, PET scan will be more accurate than those, of course. Any other questions, comments? It's a very rare tumor, so it is in Australia you would expect about 20 patients per year only. Austria has, has 8 million inhabitants, so it's a very rare tumor. And the patient you, you're reporting, she's, uh, she's still on drugs now, and on chemotherapy? Um, and she, the, the last course, the sixth course of chemotherapy yeah. was three months ago and the CT scan showed reduction of the metastas metastasis but a uh, lung... But so she, she had a, a development of a new yes, lymph of node new, metastasis. Of new lymph node metastasis, mm -hmm. yes. But she is well. And actually I got to be during the surgery, during the treatment, during the follow-up, so this I was directly involved in the, in the research in the okay. Didn't quite get what's the usual expectance of outcomes? Uh, since 95% of them are benign, there is a very good life expectancy after... For the good, for the good yeah, ones? Yeah, for the good ones, yes. But for the malignant insulinomas with liver metastasis, um, the median survival rate is not that... I don't know the exact numbers for Russia because I don't think that there are a lot of papers published on that. Did you find any? In, in Russia, no, not even one, I guess. Um, but uh, I guess it's more, mostly case reports. Yeah, definitely, like yes. This one. yes. <coughs> so, it's, not, it's not big, I know that for sure, but I don't know the exact one. Because what's quite striking for me is that they do liver transplantation. With yes. liver metastasis. Because, you know, from what we discussed, we should, Actually, we, this we, we should know what is the probability if it is just the liver. Because liver transplantation means at the end to do immune suppressive treatment. Mm -hmm. And usually, you know, immune system has something to do 
Raised but this is 